picking up with 1.5. Here's one more problem just to kind of get our minds back into things, but also I hadn't done one like this. Log base 4 of 8. So we talked on Friday about if you had like log base B of B to the M power, if these two are the same, your answer is whatever the exponent is. And when you look at log base 4 of 8, you can't write 8 as 4 to a power. So you will run into some every once in a while where you can't write them to the same base. Or, well, you can't write the 8 to the base of 4. But what you can do is you can write them both as the same base, base 2. So 4 could be 2 squared. 8 would be 2 cubed. Now once your bases are the same, your answer here is 3 halves. It's both of the exponents. The one that's up higher goes on top, the one that's down lower goes on the bottom. Which if you look back over to the rule here, this should make sense. The exponent of this b is a 1. m over 1 is just m. We just don't happen to say it when the bases are exactly the same. You know, but that is one that you could see something like it, okay? And again, this shouldn't be your first time seeing that. You should have seen those last year, but they just were not as common, okay? And they're still not as common, but they do, they, they pop up just every once in a while. All right, then we move on to the inverse trig function. So remember, we talked about just inverse functions in general looking at the graph of them, folding them over the line, y equals x, or reflecting them over the line, y equals x, uh, to get the inverse trig function, or inverse functions. Today is specific just to trig functions. So first of all, we have your sine function. Um, your sine function is a function that crosses the x-axis at 0, again at 3.14, again at 6.28, it goes up to 1, and it goes down to negative 1, something like that. And it continues in both directions, so that means it crosses 0 again at negative 3.14, at negative 6.28, which those are just your pi and your negative pi. And here we can kind of draw it over there. The harder thing to do is to understand... If I wanted to find the inverse, well, first of all, <laughs> is that a one-to-one -one function? <laughs> no, it's not. All right, but what if I take just a piece of it? And so then I have to choose which piece would I have to take, you know? So as I look at this function right here, it looks like if I take maybe this piece from here to here, would that red piece right there pass the, the horizontal line test? You know, and so then someone else says, well, why didn't you take this piece right here? Well, that doesn't pass the horizontal line test. Okay, or they might say, whoops, my bad. I wanted to take those two things away right there. Um, some people then also say, well, why didn't you take just this piece right here? Well, that only represents a part that's above the x-axis. You want to take the largest piece that you can that still passes the vertical line test. And so that's why I would choose that red piece right there. Now, that red piece right there is a piece that has a domain that goes from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. And it has a range that goes from negative 1 to positive 1. Now, when I take that piece and I reflect it over the line y equals x, so think about the line y equals x right there. If I take the line y equals x, and I reflect that red piece over, I end up getting a piece, which is easier for me to show you on this right here. You can see right here, I have your sine function, and I have that piece right there from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. Reflecting over the line y equals x is this line here. It's like me folding this thing along that line. And here's what I end up getting is this piece 
right here. draw that in over here as well. So what I end up getting is this red part here when it reflects ends up doing this and this part right here ends up doing this and so that fuchsia color piece right in here, this piece is the inverse, what we call sine inverse. It's the inverse function. So what about the domain and range of that? Well, you know what? Switch the X's and Y's. So the domain, and I'm trying to color code these, the domain of the fuchsia one right here now goes, if you can see it, negative 1 to 1. And the range goes from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. All I did was switch the domain and range for this to get to this. Because the inverse is exactly that, switching the x's and the y's with each other. Okay, does that make sense? All right, now let's do the same thing with cosine. Each one is a little bit different, so, um, you know, we can't just rely on one for the next one. All right, so the cosine curve starts up at 1. At 6.28, it ends up at 1. At 3.14, it's down at negative 1. And it does something like this. And, of course, it does the same thing over here. At negative 3.14, it's down at negative 1. At negative 6.28, it's up at 1. And so I have another one of these. That looks like that. And again, we're faced with the same problem. The problem that this is not a one-to-one -one function. And anything that's not a one-to-one -one function does not have an inverse, unless you take just a piece of it. And so if you try to do from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2 on, on this one, you'd be talking about this little hump right here above the x-axis. Is that a one-to-one -one function? No. So we can't choose the same piece. All right, so we look for, again, the largest piece that we can possibly choose. And so it's this piece right here. Again, part of it's above the x-axis, part of it's below the x-axis. So it's going to be representative of anything positive, anything negative. And then other people say, well, why didn't you choose this piece right over here? Well, anytime you can choose positive x values, you should. I could have chose that instead. However, it is more uniformly chosen to be where the x values are positive if you can. That way you have fewer mistakes that you make. All right, so now let's imagine if we would take this and reflect it over the line y equals x, what it might look like. This is not drawn to scale for sure, but... So here I have, again, a cosine of x with that little piece highlighted. If I take and I fold this over the line y equals x right along like that, I end up getting this graph right here. So you can see that this piece ends up coming up like that. So these are just a little bit strange, you know, to take and look at. So this one here is going over to negative 1. It's up at 3.14 right there, so it does one of these. And then it's going to end down here at the one right there. Yeah. And so if you can imagine taking, I always have a hard time drawing these backwards like this. And you end up with a piece like that. If you line this line up right here with your body on your paper, it's definitely easier to draw that way. Okay, you can't see through your paper, you know, to kind of flip your paper around like that. So anyways, let's first talk about the red part of this graph. The red part of this graph had a domain that went from 0 to pi. 
and had a range that went from negative 1 to positive 1. Well, the purple graph just switches the domain and range. The domain goes from negative 1 to 1, and the range goes uh, then from 0 to pi. Again, the inverse is just switching your x and your y values. And then the final trig function that we have is tangent. Okay. Your graph of tangent has these asymptotes, which the other two graphs did not have. It has asymptotes at pi over 2, which is 1.57, right around in here, and negative 1.57, about in here. And then again at 3 pi over 2, which would be about 4.71 here. This one's going to get really messy when we go. I might have to draw a second graph for it. And so this thing comes up like this and goes like this and then comes up like this and then goes like this. Comes up like this and then goes like this. I kind of went off a little bit right in there. It really should be crossed right out. Obviously not a one-to-one uh, -one function, okay? But this one's easier to choose, the piece of the function to use. The piece of the function that would be best to use on this is just this first one right here that's really close to zero. It has part of it positive, part of it negative, you know, so that's the piece we're going to choose. And when we take and we fold it over the line, y equals x, so... Here is this one here. Let's see. I'll show you here first, and we'll draw it up there. Here's your tangent function. If you fold it over the line, y equals x, like that, you end up getting this function. Kind of almost looks like the cube root function you know, that we saw when we were looking at parent functions the other day. So. When I take this one right here and fold it over the line y equals x, I end up getting, I went a little fat down here, this function here. But remember, those asymptotes go with it. So this is at pi over 2. This is at negative pi over 2. So, the domain of the green function goes from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2, but it's not included, and so we can't use brackets there because there are asymptotes. The range for this function goes negative infinity to positive infinity. So then when you take and find the inverse function, which is the red function, let's show it. The domain, you can see this thing goes all the way to the left and all the way to the right. So this here is from negative infinity to positive infinity. And the range is going to go negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. Again, it doesn't include those. And again, this isn't the first time you've seen this, okay? You did these in pre-calc. I don't know as though you did them in algebra too, but for sure we have to today. Okay, so you could be asked some questions about some graphs of those. Um, your calculator can graph these as well. Okay, so you know, understand that when you put in like cosine inverse, you know, you're just going to get this little tiny piece right here. You're not going to get like anything bigger than that just getting a little teeny. The only thing that's big is this guy right here. That's from left to right. All right, so how might we use inverse functions? And remember, it's asking the question backwards. So instead of saying, like, what is sine at pi over 2, and you say 1, instead it's asking you for the angle. It gives you the actual x or y value, depending on if it's sine inverse or cosine inverse, and you in turn have to give the angle for it. So this right here is saying, what is sine inverse of one-half? 
So it's saying on your unit circle, where is the sine value is the y value, right? Remember, the cosine value is the x value, the sine value is the y value. So where is the sine value? One half. But you can only give it in these two quadrants if it's listed like that. Unless the directions say give all places that sine is one half. So you got to watch the directions. All right, so sine inverse is, is one half, or sine is one half right here at this first spot, which do not give me 30 degrees or 60 degrees. No, 30 degrees. Make sure you're giving everything in radians. Remember, calculus is completely in radians. Okay, so this one right here, your answer would be pi over 6. I do know that sine is one half over here as well. But do you remember back here where we said where sine inverse happens to be from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2? So that means if we get to this and we have one that's down here, I would not give 11 pi over 6. I would have to say negative pi over 6. Okay, so... Hopefully you remember that from last year as well. All right, the next one here, tangent of arc sine of one-third. All right, so arc sine, I wanted to make sure and throw one of those in. Arc anything just means inverse. So arc sine of x equals sine inverse of x. Arc cosine means cosine inverse. Arc tangent means tangent inverse. Because arc stands for the angle. You know, they're talking about the actual arc. What is the angle? What is the angle when sine is one half is, or one third is what it's saying? Well, one third is not a number that's on your unit circle. So if it's not a number on your unit circle, that's where you have to take and you have to draw yourself a triangle. Draw yourself a right triangle. And where we have sine inverse of one-third, do you remember Sokotoa, right? Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. And tangent is opposite over adjacent. So when you don't recognize the numbers that are used, you draw yourself a triangle and you remember that sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So if this is my angle right here, then this is saying the opposite side is 1 and the hypotenuse is 3. You have to finish off your triangle. You have to use Pythagorean theorem in order to find the missing side. And so, let me call this side A. So I'll have A squared plus B squared equals C squared, or A squared plus 1 equals 9. And then subtract 1 from both sides. I get A squared is 8. And then take the square root. A equals um, 2 rad 2. And really it's plus or minus, but for this right here, they have to give me more information for me to know if I'm supposed to take the positive or the negative. So um, since I didn't say anything, I'm just going to use the positive here. So this side is 2 rad 2. Now, the final question is, what is the tangent of theta? So I go back to the triangle, and tangent would be opposite over adjacent. So opposite over adjacent is 1 over 2 rad 2. Then, of course, we're faced with the problem of having a radical in the denominator. You know, are you allowed to leave a radical in the denominator? And no, you're not. So I'd have to multiply the top and bottom by rad 2, which would give me square root of 2 over 4. So the answer to this is square root of 2 over 4. Again, first time you're seeing this, you did a lot of these last year, actually. And that was the second half of the year, because that was the trig portion of the year. Okay. Questions on that one? All right, and so here's one more that's just like that last one, but instead of a number, it has an X. Okay. Can anybody tell me what x is written as a fraction? x 
over 1. And that's the key to this right here. Again, you start with your triangle. You say, here's my angle. This is saying tangent is x over 1. So opposite over adjacent. So this side is x, this side is 1. I now have to find the missing side. So the missing side I'm going to call C. All right, so A squared plus B squared equals C squared means 1 squared, which is 1, plus B squared, which is 2, equals C squared, which is C squared. But I really need to find the missing side of C, so I need to get the C by itself by taking the square root of both sides. So C is the square root of 1 plus X squared. I cannot do anything with that, even if it was 1 minus X squared, I couldn't. You can't take the square root of each individually. You have to be able to factor it, and you have to factor into like 1 plus X times 1 plus X in order for you to take the square root of it. Okay, so a common mistake, you will have some that come out like this, and I have people put that the answer is this. Nah. -uh. Okay, this factors into 1 plus X and 1 minus X. They are not the same. So therefore, you cannot take the square root of them. It stays the square root of 1 minus x squared. All right, so this side is square root of 1 plus x squared. And now after you're done with that, the final question is, what is the cosine of that angle? And the cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. And so I'm going to say 1 over the square root of 1 plus x squared. Again, we're faced with the fact that we have square root in the denominator. And so we multiply top and bottom by the square root of 1 plus x squared. And we get cosine of theta equals the square root of 1 plus x squared over 1 plus x squared. And that's your answer to that problem. So it's almost like the inverse stuff they give you inside the parentheses there is all the information you need to solve the triangle and then the final question is, what is the cosine of that angle in the triangle that you started with? Okay. I imagine those will probably be some of your harder ones. Okay, or those last couple right there. Okay. Question. Everyone ask a question first.